Okay. So first of all, uh, big thanks to all my collaborators, Dr. Mighty from SAT, Dr. Toden from AP, and Dr. Uh, Andrew Venger, who is right now at uh, PFS Clinic. Um, so he actually provided all the data and all the tokens and expertise. So huge thanks to all three of them. Uh, so this is the basic outline of my talk. I'll be starting with this basic motivation, motivating example with this uh, DMI tractography data and this uh, cognitive reserve kind of prototype. And then from there, I will talk about the mean dot statistical framework, which is this feature selection, its general setting, and current literature. And now, having that stage, I will then uh, propose what I we are actually what's our approach, this filling and filling based methodology. And then the next section is basically the method site in it that we develop. Uh, I will discuss the algorithm and um, so the empirical results, both in synthetic and real data. And then if time permits, I would conclude with some kind of theoretical uh, justification. So that's the main uh, content and outline. And please feel free to instruct me if you have any kind of question during that. So let's begin with this motivational example. So what we have here is it's like a study of human brain bite method as a marker of biomarker for brain reserve. This brain reserve is basically an uh, interesting phenotype, which is nothing but like the resilience to neurodegeneration. So what happens is in many older patients, um, even though they are showing some kind of clinical um, signs of neurodegeneration from outside, from their behavior, it's not very evident that they are actually ill. So this is that's this resilience to neurodegeneration. And it has been hypothesized that human brain white matter is actually kind of a potential marker for this kind of thing. So what these domain scientists are expecting is basically they're trying to find out some kind of small section or small subgroup into this human brain white matter, which is highly associated with this kind of thing. And you can see this is like very typical uh, feature selection problem in statistics, right? So a brief description of the data. We have this in uh, equal 220 subjects. They are coming from all spectrum of the Alzheimer's disease. Like some of them are Alzheimer's disease, some of them are cognitively normal. So we have everything. And to characterize the human brain white matter, we actually considered 50 major white matter tracks, which are basically this, 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 this tracks actually, like fiber tracks in human brain. And then how to characterize the, the how to like measure it, all right? So for that, we actually divided each track into 100 special equidistant particles, right? So like along their leg. So it's basically an along track analysis. So 50 vertices, 50 tracks, each divided into 100 particles. That means we have 5,000 vertices, right? With this n equal to 200 subjects. So that gives us this. Um, uh, ultra high dimensional or high dimensional setting. So as expected, our outcome is basically the reserve values, the, the cognitive reserve values observed for each of the patients. So that's our response variable. And the predictors is basically some DMRI metric, like the function and anisotropy or peak style, some kind of DMRI metric observed at each of these vertices along the track. So that gives us this, uh, this high dimensional predictor space. Right? So it's basically a feature selection problem. We all know this. Now, what's the complex complexity we have? So now, when, I, when we started uh, working on this data, we saw this very typical uh, correlation pattern. So here, what you can see is like uh, six major white matter tracks. And I saw, I, I put there like correlation <laughs> along the track, right? So we have 100 vertices along the track. So the first observation is, yes, there is strong local dependence, and that is, this is somehow expected for this kind of high dimensional data, right? There should be some kind of high local correlation, like nearby uh, boxes or nearby uh, vertices, they should be highly correlated. But on top of that, here we are also seeing some kind of cross diagonal correlation as well, which is somehow a little bit counterintuitive because it says that if the spatial distance is increasing, the correlation is also increasing. Right? Now, from a biological perspective, this can be justified because this CC2, this corpus callosum 2, 3, 6, these are like extremely long tracks and they spread through like this right side of the human brain to left side of the human brain. So because of this, this kind of uh, structure, 
even though the spatial distance is increasing because of their symmetric uh, position with respect to the human brain, they are highly correlated. So that's how the correlation is actually coming because of their symmetric position with respect to the human brain. And that's how why we are seeing this kind of cross diagonal correlation. But even though this is biologically justifiable, it's very difficult to actually kind of estimate this kind of structure because for some tracks we have this, for some other tracks we do not have this. So there is no standard correlation structure. And I do not put here, but uh, there is also a higher amount of correlation between the tracks as well. So how to deal, and why this is very important? Because standard feature selection model cannot tackle much multipolar. This is, this is kind of um, straightforward and I will show this in my simulation studies as well. So that was one of the major difficulties we have. And it seems like uh, this high correlation is not very particular thing. It's basically kind of common in majority of the uh, data sets. Like, this is like the uh, riboflavin data set, which is a gene expression data. And you can see humongous amount of correlation. So now let's talk about the general setting of the feature selection because we now we understood that, okay, this is a feature selection problem. So it's nothing in, in methodological perspective, it's nothing like we have this row wise, we have this individual level data and column wise, we have this genomic features or some kind of DMRA metrics, like the predictors, ultra dimensional predictors. And the, our response is basically this one, which is like the, uh, some kind of phenotyping, you know, like disease severity level, or in our case, the brain reserve factors, right? Or can I ask a, maybe a silly question? Sure. So why do we have to select features even though it's high dimensional. So why do we have to select some features? So what what are like, uh, why do we have to select some features? I know it's high dimensional, but I mean oh okay yeah so it's been actually hypothesized or we have seen this like even though we have this humongous amount of uh, number of features not all of them are actually associated with the response only some small subpart is actually associated. So if we know that through some, some small section, it helps in many ways. Like first, obviously it can give you like much better understanding of the mechanism, how the response is associated with the uh, predictors. And on top of that, it would give you much more flexibility for downstream tasks. Like, like we do, if we need to predict or classification or so this kind of problem, we don't need to deal with this extremely high dimensional data. We can just work with this small selected group of it. So these are actually, so actually these are the advantages I, I mentioned. So this can help you like enhance the mm, reproducibility because it will minimize the number of false discoveries, right? If you can control the false discovery rate, this would give you, you know, like, uh, this will help you like how to overfit the data and give you much better generalization. And third, as I said, it, uh, reduce, it will reduce the computational cost for downstream tasks, like the prediction or classification or something. Right, given this selected set of features. So that's the basic motivation of feature selection. Mathematical, what's the math, mathematical background? So it's like just stating the same thing in a different way. Like we have in IIT data points, right? So our Y is the response features and response variables, and the X is basically the genomic features or the predictors, right? They are jointly following some distribution, unknown distribution, we don't know that, P, and the feature, we are dealing with ultra dimensional data. So this feature dimension P is much, much higher than the sample size. So that's the basic set. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to uncover the true set of small features, which are actually associated with one. Now, how to, how to define that mathematically? We can go in this way. Like the set S0 is basically this true set of features for which conditional on the features in S0, the response is independent with the features outside S0, like S0 complex, right? Or in other words, the conditional distribution of Y given X only depends on the features in S0, right? And we are trying to understand or estimate this unknown true set S0 by our data. So that's the feature selection method, and our final estimate will be TN. So in other, other words, we want to find an optimal subset of informative features while learning a predictive model. Now, what are, the, what are the challenges? 
obviously we don't know how y and x is related so there is unknown relationship uh, we want to do it in a model free way and we have to deal with alter dimensionality and the third part is if we are going for a little bit complex methodology we don't know how to compute the close from distribution of the statistical estimates or the p-values right so that is the main three challenges we are trying to deal here in this problem <laughs> Now, how to assess the performance of feature selection? So these are the common metrics, right? We want to maximize the power while we want to um, control or minimize some kind of error rate. For this talk, we will talk about the false discovery rate, the number of the expected uh, ratio of false discoveries, right? As we know, for power, power, the higher the better, and for FDR or for some kind of uh, error, it should be controlled by some user-specific value like 0 0.05. Now the problem is the majority of the existing methods are dependent on p-value and some intrinsic properties of the p-value, like this independence or the positive regression dependence on a subset. Like the benjamin hodgeberg the very popular benjamin hodgeberg the method is actually dependent on this. But there is no way we can justify this kind of algorithms beforehand for a real data, right? And secondly, more important, if we extend our modeling framework from basic linear model to like generalized linear model or like um, deep, neural mod deep learning models, generating an interpretable p-value is itself an, an research problem. We don't know actually, right? We don't have any close form solution. So we need to come up with some kind of false discovery estimation method, which is p-value free. Okay. Now let's talk about some, some basic uh, traditional methods that we use for feature selection. We all know, right? We will use generally some kind of AIC, BIC kind of technique for model selection, right? Like model selection. But uh, there are other alternatives which can extend this to high dimension. But generally speaking, they are not very feasible for high dimension data. There are uh, this empirical, uh, like uh, regularized risk minimization setting, like the lasso or elastic net kind of thing. Uh, like here you can see that this is just the minimizing the loss function with some kind of a regularization. This loss function can be characterized for a simple linear model in this way, whereas for uh, the uh, regularization is nothing but the L2 kind of penalty. For lasso, it's L1. For elastic net, is a combination of L1 and L2 regularization. This is very nice. We have established statistical theory for this. This is very straightforward. This is very easy to implement as well. But the, the, the the, the con is like it's a model based framework, right? We are restricting our modeling <coughs> setting to linear model only. And this, although in many cases this is work, this this will work very perfectly, sometimes they are often poor in practice because of this modeling restriction. We need to probably come up with some kind of model preset. Okay. Next, in 2023, if we are talking about feature selection, we have to talk about this knockoff feature, not knockoff. Framework, which is first published by Manuel Candice's group in 2015. This is a very nice way of feature selection. What they are doing is, it's a first of all, why this is very nice because it's uh, model free and it's non asymptotic. It can give you no non asymptotic guarantee. So you don't need to like intend to intend to infinity and then we will say our thing. It's not like that. It's a model free and a finite sample guarantee. So the main idea is that. Uh, Instead of uh, just like we have this high dimensional predictors x, right? So what they are doing is they calibrate a new proxy matrix x tilde, which is exactly similar, like which maintains all the dependency properties of x, but this is unassociated with y, right? So it's like a calibration matrix. Then that gives you like that gives you like a very nice framework to check the null features and non-null features, right? Because you know. That for the uh, for the this proxy matrix x tilde everything is unassociated with one, right? So what they are doing it's basically something like this: we calculate some kind of feature importance for each of the true feature and its knockoff counterpart. Now the idea is if the features are actually if it's a null feature, then both the importance score for the true feature and its knockoff counterpart are zero, right? Whereas if it's a true feature then its knockoff counterpart's importance is very close to zero, whereas the, uh, the true feature importance is not zero. So this difference would be significant. So we calculate this contrast function from true feature's importance minus its knockoff part's importance. And then for null feature, it should be very close to zero, something like this. 
and for normal feature, it should be greater than zero. And that can that give you like a very nice way to uh, check or do this false discovery that selection, right? As I said, we have nice theoretical guarantee for this, but there is no free lunch. The the caveat is to do this to to generate the knockoff features X tilde, we need to know the predictors distribution, right? Which can be a very difficult, daunting task in practice because we have these ultra dimensional features and we don't know. Many times we don't know much idea what should be the sampling distribution for those features, right? So we need to estimate it, and that's another complexity. So that's where we try to work in our method to deal with that kind of complexity. And the other thing is here, we, I just showed like the model X knockoffs generally fail under severe multi collinear. It's just an empirical simulation where uh, this vertical bars are basically the power, uh, sorry, the FDR. And this horizontal line is the power. It's a very simplistic simulation using linear model. And what I did is basically like increasingly simultaneously increase just the uh, auto correlation coefficient among the features. Like here, these are extremely highly correlated features like the GMRI matrix. And here is basically the features are kind of integral. What we are seeing is the knockoff is actually losing is false discovery that control. Here they are controlled under 20%, but you can see for the for the blue line, it's basically it is losing its control for highly correlated features. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry to jump in. So I'm wondering uh, when you're doing your knockoff simulation, are you using the knockoff tensor or knockoff plus? I am using knockoff plus. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, we can, we can talk about this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I have another question because you just said that Markov, I mean, knockoff has finite sample guarantee. And then, like, what was what? What am I missing here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So knockoff has finite sample guarantee. Cool. Very good question. So uh, knockoff has finite sample guarantee, but it has under some assumptions, right? So the assumption is you have to estimate the distribution properly, right? So for that, if you if you look here, there are basically two things. The blue lines are basically knockoffs estimated, which is the realistic thing from the data. We estimate the features distribution and then apply the knockoff. Right? And the second one is, as this is a simulation study, I know the two data generation factor, right? So this this uh, orange line is something like it's the knockoff using the true distribution. I'm not estimating it, but if you look for the true distribution, it is actually controlling the false discovery rate, right? So there is nothing wrong in the knockoff feature, but the thing is, we don't in a realistic situation we don't know the true distribution. This knockoff true is actually not not feasible in real situation. It, it's a sim for simulation it's a nice demonstration, but for true real data, it's not feasible. So yeah. Very nice question. So, uh, if we go from here, the other options we have several knockoff model based knockoff generation method. Like this model X knockoff uses Gauche, it assumes that the features are following some kind of Gaussian distribution and then generate the knockoff. The Stacia et al. and uh, this method, this paper is actually using in genetic studies, they are assuming that the Features are actually kind of following some kind of hidden Markov model, and from that distribution, they are estimating the norms, right? It, it's very good. It's very it's working very nice in that setup, but it's it's it, it's not very generalizable, right? It depends on some kind of distribution and assumption still. Now, recent works, people are actually working on deep learning. They are using some kind of model-free deep learning methods to Estimate the knockoffs and this uh, Liu and Zeng 2019 and this Romano et al. paper, the deep knockoffs, they are actually not nothing like model free knockoff. They are very good. And the third option is basically forget about the model based setting. It's just if you bring the deep learning into the framework, people are using neural networks to uh, estimate this false discovery rate and to this feature selection. So all these papers are actually doing that. Now the caveat is. All these deep learning based methods, this is number two and number three, they are typically trained on big and small p problem because it's neural network. We need huge amount of training data. And we don't have that. For our case, we have n equal to 220. So, as yet, right? Uh, there are other options, uh, alternative knockoffs like Gaussian mirrors and MD multiple data splitting. They are also very good. Um, we implemented this, but uh, these are very kind of similar to knockoff actually. 
And the third, last option is basically the random forest quest methods. They uh, they are highly potential. They right now people are actually working on it for like ultra high dimensional random forest quest methods. But yeah, I mean it's not very straightforward. We did not actually work on that 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 route, but I want to in future probably. Okay, so can, now what's our solution? Can I ask a question sure. first? Going going back to the, the methods you tried. Um, like I, I'm not super familiar with it, but from what I can recall, um, isn't an like brain data huh? a good application for like fused lasso or like grouped fused lasso, um, like grouping by the tracks maybe, and then exactly, exactly. So I kind of implemented that, but still, when you are using the grouped lasso, it's basically nothing but we will go back to this setting, right? It's a regularized risk, risk minimization, but instead of this simple LQ down penalty, you are using some kind of fused lasso penalty or group kind of penalty, right? Yeah. But still, you are kind of using the linear method. So that's one, like it's model based, still it's more. So yeah, uh, if you use the fused lasso, uh, it kind of helps uh, in many cases, but what we are actually kind of looking here is basically more like a model free of feature selection method, which doesn't depend on this linearity assumption or this kind of assumptions. Because in, yeah. So what we did is something like fused glass or something like that. We come up with some kind of regularization technique on uh, non-parametric deep learning based methods where we are not relying on the linear model. Okay. So what's our solution? Um, if we divide existing methods in feature selection, we can come up with this kind of three major classification, feature selection consistent, sheer scaling, and error control. So feature selection consistent means our estimated set will exactly match with the true index set with high probability, right? So that's a feature selection consistent. It's the best case scenario for that. We have the power guarantee and we have the error control. But the caveat is, they generally come with very, very strong assumption. Like, you know, lasso, lasso is feature selection consistent under, under strong irrepressible condition, which is not um, generally satisfied for majority of the real data. So what we can do, taking a step down, we can either ensure the sheer scaling property. That means we, we will select a little bit bigger set with high probability, this DN hat will include the true set, yes, not, right, with high probability. So that's the sheer scaling property. And for that, we have the power guarantee, but we will lose the error control, right, with mild, uh, mild assumption. On the other hand, with mild assumption, we can do the other thing. We will be a little bit restrictive. We will lose the power guarantee, but what we can say is basically, we will not have much false information. Our error rate is one. So what we try to do is basically, we try to combine the last two steps. With mild assumption, we first screen, we first reduce the dimension to a little bit lower dimensional setting. And then we do the error controlling, which is called the screening step. So that's what we are trying to propose actually, screening and cleaning. It's a two-step procedure. First, we do the dimension reduction. Then we, in the cleaning step, we construct some kind of p-value free estimate of the false discovery there. And with that, we control the error. So that's our numbers. In, in pictorial sense, it's basically something like this. We have this data, right? Where this, uh, Blue lines are basically representing the true features. Straining step, we're just reducing the dimension. We get, we like eliminate majority of the null features, like the, these gray lines. And then in the cleaning step, we further reduce it, further clean the null features uh, from this uh, selected screening step. And we, we select majority of the true features and probably some null features in error control. So that's, that's our method. So that's, kind of my final, final overview of my summary. What we discussed so far is basically a generic feature selection framework in supervised learning setting. Um, we talk about the AIC, PIC, lasso kind of method and uh, more recent knockoff based and deep learning based methods. Um, while knockoff methods are very, very nice, but we need to know actually the generating the, the features distribution, which, is, which can be a little bit complex in many uh, practical data analysis. On the other hand, majority of the real best methods typically need a humongous amount of training data, which you do not many times have. And the last part is, yeah, we, I, we talked about it, like majority of the existing methods depends on the p-value, but if we are using some kind of complex method, we don't know how big is it. 
And finally, that's our method. We will describe it now. Uh, before I go in that part, any, any, any question or? Okay. So let's start the second part. So I will start with the with a with an empirical uh, simulation with the majority of the methods that we have seen in the in the in the first part, right? So this is like model model x true, model x uh, for uh, model x estimated, then the subnet um, deep fake. What this blue and red red color is indicating is blue is, means it's basically big piece model like ultra high dimensional setting, but which we are kind of dealing in this talk. And the red is basically the big and small p, like we have big, big training data, which is favorable for this deep neural network. Types. And what you see here is basically basically three um, setting for each of the method, rho equal to 0.1, rho equal to 0.5, and rho equal to 0.9. Rho means it's the auto correlation between the features, right? So rho equal to 0.9 is basically similar to the uh, setting we are dealing in the tractography. Many things are going on here. Let me just uh, explore this uh, one by one. So we can see model X knockoff is very nice. Its power is very high. And um, it majority of the time it selects, uh, it, it FDR is controlled less than this uh, upper bound 20%. But for higher correlation, yeah, we are losing it. But for true model X knockoff, we are OK. But this is unrealistic setting. For deep learning based methods, uh, it's not very good actually for low dimensional setting. Uh, sorry, for low sample size setting, we can see even if for low correlation, its power is not good. And as soon as we are going in the big, big and small p setting, yes, yes, its power is very, very nice. But the problem is uh, it cannot handle the multi coordinated problem, right? For higher, little bit higher correlation, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, it is losing its edge control. It is like selecting a many, many, many features. So it's not very. Okay, so these are the three challenges we are trying to deal with, right? Ultra high dimensionality, extreme multi coordinality, and we are trying to develop a p value free estimate of the APK. How to do it? As we said, we kind of trying to do the last two step one after another, right? With my options, like first screening and then cleaning. In the first screening step, we are actually trying to deal with the first two challenges, the ultra high dimensionality and the extreme multi coordinality. How we are doing it? We are implementing some kind of uh, screening method and get a reduced number of selection set is, is hat, which with high probability will contain the true index that is right. So that's the dimension reduction with uh, the with high probability we are really we are retaining the true features. So that's what that we are doing here. And the second to deal with this extreme multi collinearity we are clustering the correlated features. And uh, then we will go from the screening to cleaning, right? In the cleaning, we will use some kind of resampling technique and uh, estimate the cluster FDR. And in controlling the cluster FDR, we finally select the features. So now let's look at the one after another, this, this one. So finally, we call our method uh, like side in X, screening and cleaning incorporated. Deep neural network. OK. So this is our data. Um, we first fit the data into the screening, and then from the screening, we get the uh, selected set and the cluster. We fit them into the cleaning, and then this is the finally selected set of clusters. That's the basic outcome. What are the major theoretical framework we are doing? Or what are the difference between the our this framework and the knockoff features? Here, like knockoff, we are not assuming any specific functional relationship between y and x, but we impose a very high level assumption on the distribution of this. We don't need to estimate the distribution like knockoff, but we are imposing this assumption that the predictors follow a non paranormal distribution. What's this non paranormal distribution? It's like nothing like there exists some unknown differentiable function g for which this gjxj is following some normal distribution. Okay. So X is not following the normal distribution, but there exists some unknown function G for which GX follows the normal distribution. That's what we are just measuring. 
This non-parametric transform distribution is to cover so wide range of parametric families. It's a simple parametric family of distribution. And the beauty of this setting is this GX, this transformed feature GX, the Gaussian uh, transform feature GX, they actually preserve the conditional dependence, de dependency structure of X, the two uh, the, the observable features, right? So even if we are transforming X from GX, we don't lose the conditional dependency structure of X. Okay, how we are doing it? Let's look at one by one. Can I ask a question? Sure. Go back. So can you clarify that? Because I've never, I don't know anything about non paranormal distributions. So can you give me like one example like that's not non paranormal distributions? That's not non paranormal or, distributions. Or just, just to give you some, some example that is non, -par non paranormal or is not non paranormal. <laughs> Yes, um, you know, like the uh, box box transformation, yeah. like uh, from many distribution, like if you apply a little bit of uh, like any linear, uh, any any kind of uh, like functional transformation, we can transform it to normal distribution. I mean, if you transform from normal, then it's not non -parallel. No, 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 I'm not saying that I'm transforming from, from, no. from normal, I'm okay. saying transforming to normal. Oh, okay. Right? Like, our like in box topics, I think it's like something like our uh, distributions are like from uniform distribution. Then you fit something. That's of, one dimensional, right? Uh, but here, here it's multi-dimensional. Yeah, but, that's something that makes me more concerned. Yeah, but see, it's like G J. It's not like the J is fixed for all the dimension. They are saying it's basically dimension wise. So okay, you can you can marginally trans for any di continuously distributed X. You can marginally trans find GJ such that they are marginally normal, but then yes. it's about the joint normal that I'm more concerned. Yes, that's why that's why not all the yeah, I know. Will, yeah. will, will, will satisfy this. That's why this is called the non paranormal transformation. Yeah. Uh, I don't exactly remember uh, the example, but uh, I saw this paper. This is a new at all uh, 2009 paper in JMLA. So they uh, Come up with many many examples of this 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 distribution and habit. Okay, and um, I actually have a couple of other um, experiments with the non parameter transformation. Uh, we can check it. Okay, I'm kind of confused about that as well. Actually, though, because like how if you're getting a function for each of the um, features independently, yes, I, I don't understand how that is helpful. Right, like that is helpful because um, I think that might be a little bit um, explained when I go to the next slide. Sure. So it's like uh, it's an estimation procedure. We know how to estimate this GJ from the data. So that's this non paranormal transformation. This, the this, this overall G function. Overall G function. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. From the data, we can transform the data from X to GX, but this G is unknown. We will estimate the G. So that's the non parallel transformation. But you're estimating it from the individual functions? Uh, from the whole data, actually. Not like, G, we are not saying that this GJ um, is independent. Yeah, this this sigma is- uh, Okay, so they, they, they are independent. No, 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 they are not. Yeah, that makes not sense. independent. The sigma is not, sigma is not diagonal matrix. But what I tried to say in the last part is that, that GJ preserves the conditional dependency structure is, in this paper, they have this theoretical uh, uh, theorem that says that the sigma, the, the precision matrix of the transform feature GX is same as the precision matrix of X. So they, the transform features and the true features, they will, they will uh, um, preserve the conditional dependency structure. And that's what we are actually trying to exploit in our, our next step. So, yeah. OK. What do I do? So here, so, so our input, you can see the our input is basically y and x, right? And then what our output is basically some kind of active set S and hat, a reduced dimensional set, which is a subset of this whole uh, feature dimension one to be, right? What are the tools we are using? It's basically A Z C S method published here. Uh, it's nothing but this Gaussian transformation using non-parallel and then testing. The idea is very simple. We transform X 
Y and X both to the to its Gaussian counterpart, like the Donter number transformation using the Donter number transformation, and come come up with this Y tilde and X tilde. This Y tilde and X tilde they are normal distribution, and we all know if our features are if if the, if our variables are following normal distribution, how to check their dependence? How to check if they are independent or dependent? Right? It's a very simple uh, hypothesis testing for normal distribution. So that's here we are. Doing like y tilde, we are checking if y tilde and x tilde are some bivariate normal distribution with independence correlation matrix, right? And that's this test called tensor test. We will select those features which are basically rejected in this test, right? So that's what that's how we are using this Gaussianity of the data and the fact that in the non parameter transformation, the dependency structure is actually preserved. Next step is that we, we, we are done with the dimension reduction step, right? Uh, from the screening step, we are our, 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 for the first part, our output is basically a reduced dimensional active set. Yes, and have. Now we, are, we will deal with the correlation part. What we are doing here is basically, our output will be some kind of clustered C1 to CP, where this active set is basically a collection of all the clusters, like union of all the clusters. And then from each cluster, we will select one cluster representative, which is the most important class, uh, most important feature inside each cluster. What the tool we are using? We are using the non parameter transformation and no dual class, right? Why? Because non parameter transformation says that it will preserve the position matrix. So if we do our calculation on the Transformed features uh, position matrix. It's basically the same thing if we do it in the same in the original features position matrix. But the helpful thing is now this this transform features on Gaussian. So we can use the node wise lasso to estimate its <coughs> its matrix. Right. This node wise lasso is a popular uh, popular approach. We can use it to estimate a position matrix of a linear model of a Gaussian distributed linear model. So we are using that. And from each cluster, we are actually selecting one representative. Which representative, which will show the maximum divergence from normal, uh, by very independent, by very normal uh, from the first step, like the tensor lattice, because that's like the maximum, um, uh, the maximum distant uh, feature from the independent. So that's like the most important feature in the inside one cluster, right? So that's our feature representative. So what's our output from the screening step? Is basically these clusters, and from each cluster, we have one cluster representative. Do you have to have a fixed number of clusters? No, no, no. It's basically coming from the data. So, well. like, um, um, it's we, we are actually just combining uh, the conditionally dependent features, something like that, from the precision matrix. Because, because precision matrix is sparse, right? We are just combining. The features which are conditionally dependent on each other, and that's how we are creating the clusters. Last part, cleaning. That's the I think the more important part. Uh, how to come up with some kind of first discovery rate controlling approach in this one. So our output is our input is basically we know right. Our input is the y. Sorry, uh, sorry. Our input is basically the y, and this uh, set of clusters. And S and tilde is basically the set of cluster representative. From each of the cluster, we took one representative, right? And our output would be some selected features from C1 to CP, which will satisfy this um, this uh, FDR control. Now, how to come up with this? That I will describe now. What are the tools we are using? We are actually using some kind of bootstrapping or resampling kind of approach and the neural network to model this uh, nonlinearity into the between the Y and X. For this part, I am using lasso net, which is nothing but uh, just a nonlinear extension of very popular lasso that we use. What is this? It's basically a residual residual neural network. Nothing like we input all the features. Of the, the input layer is here. Now the second part is the fit for our neural network, and the output is y hat. And because of it's a neural residual neural network, we have this linear layer is added. Into the final part, right? So it's basically x. The x maps to this theta transpose x. Is this this is the linear part plus 
this nonlinear neural network part, which is basically this HW, right? So that's the HW neural network. And why this is very nice extension of Lasso? Because in this part, we have this linear form, right? This theta transpose X is linear. And we can actually put the Lasso type of LO1 penalty to induce the sparsity. So that's why this is like a nonlinear extension of Lasso. And they call, the authors call this method as like Lasso net. So this is the uh, regular, this is the um, uh, loss function that we are optimizing here. This theta and W are basically the parameters of the neural network. We are trying to come up, we're trying to estimate it by optimizing this loss function, this, this loss plus this um, regularization term, lasso type of regularization term. Now, how to, how to, what should I say? Treat this algorithm to come up with this p value free method, right? So for that, what we are using is some kind of perturbation booster. We perturb the lasso net. Remember, the lasso net is something like this, right? This is the, this is the objective function of lasso. Now here, what we are doing, we are just inducing some kind of perturbation each time. This UB, this is like the for bth step. The UB is nothing but an, an IID generated bound pair positive, some kind of stochastic perturbation. And each time we are perturbing the MSC by loss, loss terms here, and we are optimizing the um, the parameters. And we, we come up with, for the VH step, we have this theta hat B, W hat B. And that's how we come up, we repeat this step many times and we come up with a array of, uh, or ensembling of model. Okay, that's done. So that's like the calibration of the setting. Now, how to come up with the feature selection or feature importance setting, right? So that's like this lambda J hat B. It's like very common in, uh, feature selection, like how much, how much the, um, in the regularization path, how much the feature can serve, survive into the model. Like after a certain value of the regularization uh, parameter lambda, the feature will vanish from the model, right? So that, that, that tipping point can be a feature importance, can be, con, uh, can be thought of as a feature, feature importance for each of the features. So that's what our lambda j had the maximum value of lambda up to which the j representative exists in, into the model for the bth part of question, right? And then we rank the feature importance uh, one after another. So lambda one up to lambda two, it is the rank. This i two i i one i two i p these are the ranks. Now let's look at this very interesting plot. This is actually a simulation setting where this. Uh, Red dotted line are actually the position of the true features, the first three, right? These are the position of the true features. And the green line, green uh, color is actually represented uh, the features selected by the side net, by your method, and the blue are the not selected by your method. What we are doing is basically, it's basically the ranks of the important scores in the y axis we are plotting, right? And this, uh, the area of each, each ellipse is basically proportional to the variability over the, over the bootstrap replications. So what we are seeing for the true features, there is actually not much variation over the bootstrap replication. Every time their ranks are among the first few, the true features are very, very consistent among all the bootstrap replications. But as soon as we come in the null sector, sometimes they're important, sometimes they are not. Sometimes they vanish very early in the regularization path, sometimes they are not. And that's why in many, many, many bootstrap replication, their variability is quite high, right? So, and then we use basically this, this idea to distinguish what's null feature and what's non null feature. That's our job, right? For the feature selection problem. We check which features are very, very consistent in the, uh, in the um, different bootstrap replication. They, are, they should be very highly probable for a non null feature. And the features who are highly variable, most probably they are null features. So bottom line is importance of the true features are stable, but the null features are highly variable in the bootstrap replication, the bootstrap distribution. And we can see this, uh, then how to come up with a statistically principled method to actually um, distinguish the null and null. So that's what we are doing here. We come up with the the center of each ellipse is basically the average rank over B bootstrap perturbation, B bootstrap replication, right? This is like the average rank of each feature. The idea is true features rank should be at the beginning, like first few features are, should be the true features. And 
then they will be high. Now, we also know that the true feature should be highly centered. They, they should not be highly varied. So we consider a small neighborhood centered around that two, that, uh, that uh, average line, right? Now, as we see, as we have seen in, the, in, the, in this picture, the null predictors should always fall outside, right? Because they are highly variable. So they should always, majority of the time, they should always fall outside that small neighborhood here. Small neighborhood means I am assuming there is a small neighborhood centering this, uh, this average value, right? But the normal predictors, so the true features, they are very highly, highly centered. They should consistently fall inside this neighborhood, right? And that's, that, that gives us this final estimated value. Uh, I'm not going into much detail, but this is actually calculating how many times in the booster replication the importance are falling outside that, that small number. The idea is for the true features, they should always uh, in, stay inside the neighborhood and this upper, this E0 hat delta should be zero and FDR hat should be zero for those features and uh, they should be always, always uh, uh, selected. So that's the idea of this false discovery estimation. Uh, I don't think I have much time left. Uh, this is a very basic sim schematic figure of our algorithm. I will go into, I'm going to skip it, but I'm happy to chat about it later. Let's go to the empirical result. And uh, uh, here I generated I generated a data set from like single index model, which is like a very basic nonlinear model. And among them, only five features are actually true features. So our estimated our estimated number of clusters should not be more than five, right? Okay, now let's, I also implemented this other competing methods like Lasso, ModelX, uh, Sarbnet, DFS, LassoNet and everything. And then I plot the power, FDR and number of selected features. What we can see here, yes, many times, many methods are having higher power, but whenever they are doing that, because they are not controlling the false discovery rate, their false discovery rate is also very high, right? So what we can, um, conclude from the first two row is basically Sirenet maintains the power FDR balance. It maximizes the power while successfully controlling the FDR always below this black line, right? We are controlling the false discovery rate. But on the other hand, the third row is also very important. It kind of adaptively adjusts the number of features. So what this these three things here you can see, like these are the, again, row equal to 0 0.1, row equal to 0 0.5, and row equal to 0 0.9, right? So as you can see, for row equal to 0 0.1, we are just selecting up five features. That's it. That's what we will do, right? Our power is high and the FTL is low, as we can see here. But as we are going, increasing, as we are increasing the correlation, we can see that the number of features are actually going higher and higher, right? But this, this, this values, uh, I think these are very small that you can not see. These are actually saying that we are actually selecting five clusters only, right? Because we have five true features and we are actually selecting five clusters. So this uh, around 40 features are kind of nicely clustered into, into five distinct clusters. That's it. So we are adaptively adjusting the number of selected features to tackle the multiple collinearity. So that's one aspect we wanted to uh, mention. We applied this in many uh, real data sets. So this is like one of the CCL cancer cell line encyclopedia data set. This is a gene expression data. Uh, we have 550 kind of sample size, whereas the number of genes are like 19,000. I applied several methods here. Uh, should I increase? Okay. Yeah. So here you can see that these are like five many different drugs. I, I, I hear uh, this is first first part is basically the number of genes selected by Sidenet and number of genes selected by Lassonet. We can see that Lassonet is kind of failing to reduce the dimension. It's actually quite high, right? Whereas we are selecting much, much lesser number of features. Now I am checking the what's okay. Given that we are only selecting 25 or 12 genes out of this 19,000 genes, what's our prediction result? If we look at it, we are getting much, much better performance, right? This Sidenet plus RT is nothing but we are using Sidenet for the feature selection and RT is the regression tree for the prediction parts, right? 
So this side network plus regression tree, this like this scheme is giving us a very nice result, both in terms of test MSE and the correlation between the true uh, value and the predicted value, something like this. I don't have much time left, so I am going to skip to the next part, which is the main motivation motivating example that I discussed at the beginning. So we implemented this method on the typography data. We have 220 sample size and 5,000 predictor space, whereas we have like 50 major void matter tracks. And this Y is basically our response is the Y, the reserve value. And after controlling the false discovery rate at um, 20 percent, we got these four tracks. Some some vertices of these four tracks are getting selected. Um, to justify this uh, this result, uh, we went basically two ways. The first part is basically the, the domain sense part. These few tracks are basically highly important or they are well known to be highly associated with many important cognitive abilities like um, adapting to a new language or something like that. So it makes sense that if these tracks would be associated with something like some phenotype like um, brain reserve. And second, we also um, did um, that the prediction task as well. Like we first implemented SIDINET to select some features and then uh, use those features for prediction. And we showed that um, we are actually gaining in terms of the predi prediction, even if we are reducing the dimension in like just like 20 or 50 something. Like that. Um, having said that, do, do I have time for? Uh, you no, know, you probably just have probably just five minutes left. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you could just pass through the theoretical. Yeah. Just so the thing is like uh, the main theoretical aspect that we are trying to deal here is basically this perturbation thing. Uh, I'll go back to this one. Yes. We know that the neural network is very nice in, uh, the, in estimating uh, or the prediction purpose, right? But what we are doing here, we are it's something like the stability selection, right? So we are perturbing it many, many, many times and checking what are the features put, whose behavior is very, very consistent over several replication of the booster. And what are the features who are highly variable in the booster replication? So that's what gave us this nice distinction between the true and false features. And that's how we actually created our false discovery rate, p-value free false discovery rate um, estimation. In the theoretical study, we did come up with a uh, false discovery rate controlled um, theory, uh, but uh, under the under a very basic uh, neural network, generalized neural network kind of setting. Uh, but due to the time purpose, I am going to uh, skip that. But I am happy to chat about it. Okay, so finally, con to conclude, um, in summary, this is basically we work with the uh, um, it's like a data adaptive two step. Um, multi-resolutional feature selection for highly correlated features. Um, they run several works in the linear model setting for this kind of highly correlated, but to, to the best of our knowledge, there are not any method in neural network or deep learning setting for this kind of um, uh, highly correlated features and FTR control purpose. So in that case, we are very excited about this work. and. Um, Uh, it couple of contribution we already mentioned, like uh, it does this nonlinear feature selection plus FDR control plus it can handle extreme multi collinearity. It aids in the explainability of this black box neural network model because neural network or deep learning models are typically known as black box. They cannot interpret, we cannot interpret them. And finally, it can tie with many downstream tasks, right? First, we select the features and then we can use the selected features for prediction, classification, other other tasks. Um, we are working on extending these methods in many several other direction. The majority is basically how to extend the, this framework for handling like longitudinal data. So here we are assuming that we are uh, we have the uh, the DMRI metric only for one time, right? But in the more interesting application might be that the patients are coming into the clinic and we are observing them with time, and we have the clinical data or the longitudinal data uh, with time. So how to incorporate this time varying variable selection setting, that would be very interesting. And uh, yeah, that's all actually. This paper is currently in the review and uh, if you are interested, please check this uh, 
uh, archive version. Um, these are few references. This is the funding. Thank you for that. And the uh, University of Michigan Memory and Aging Project, they gave us the data. Um, Dr. Bender helped with all this kind of data and uh, um, data oriented uh, knowledge. And uh, that's it. Thank you for that. Yes.